I was born in a hypo tray. Photography has been a part of my life now for 70 years. But wait a minute. I'm getting ahead of my story. My maternal great-grandfather, George Hagee Pratt, was an early-day portrait photographer. Along with his brother, Julius, the young men started a studio at Red Oak, Iowa in the mid-1880s. In 1891, Granddad Pratt moved to Waxahachie, Texas, and opened a studio there. He moved to Paris, Texas in 1900, opening a new studio. The building was destroyed in the Great Paris Fire of 1916, but he continued operations in different locations in the city, even opening a second studio in nearby Cooper until 1930, when he retired. These examples of his work are called cabinet cards. The print was mounted on decorative cardboard, usually inscribed with the name of the studio. The colors of the images are due to various chemical toning processes used in those days. Granddad Pratt made this portrait of my grandmother holding my mother in 1922. It's an example of a light oil color print. The black and white negative was developed and printed in the standard manner. Then the print was chemically treated to produce a sepia tone. After drying, the print was hand colored using transparent dyes, an art form that is now pretty much lost to the ages. Granddad Pratt was old school. He started with ambrotypes in tin types and then moved to wet plates and finally Eastman dry plates, some of which are shown here. In the very early years, developing chemicals were mixed by weight from individual compounds. When Eastman began to package developers, it made things much easier. The safe light is a kerosene lantern with a red filter. George Pratt Jr., my grandfather, helped out in the studio and darkroom, but decided the photographer's life was not for him. After serving in World War I, he went to work in the oil business and became a pioneer oil man in the Texas Panhandle. However, he did take up amateur motion pictures. With his brother, they processed much of the early 16 millimeter black and white film in a garage darkroom. Here are some brief clips made in 1941 of oil well drilling near Amarillo. By the time he passed away in 1977, a 50 year moving picture archive of our family and life in America contained over 35,000 feet of film. George Eastman perfected the roll film camera in 1888. His first cameras had to be returned to Kodak for processing of the paper negative. About 1895, Eastman perfected roll films using a cellulose nitrate base. The film could be processed at the drugstore, by the user, or sent to Kodak. The films were slow and simple, but it was a huge improvement. At the upper right is a 1909 model Kodak Brownie. Next is a more familiar box brownie from the 1920s. Along the bottom are several specimens of Kodak folding cameras from a number one Kodak Junior to a vest pocket Kodak. The large Kodak Autographic at the far left featured a metal stylus that the photographer could use to write on the film through a red covered window. The pressure from the stylus made an impression on the emulsion. When developed, the information showed up on the print in white. Hundreds of thousands of these folding cameras were made by Kodak's Hawkeye Works in Rochester, New York. In the 1920s, folks went out taking pictures, which gave rise to the term going Kodaking. By the beginning of World War II, roll film cameras began to evolve. My father, J. Howard Miller, grew up in Clovis, New Mexico. He got started taking snapshots and later sold his work to the local newspaper. After college, he got a job with an advertising company in Amarillo and also did freelance work for the Amarillo newspapers. Just before the war started, he and his buddy Woodfin Camp were hired as the permanent photo staff. Dad joined the Army Air Force and served stateside in two photo companies until the war ended. 
He went back to the Amarillo Papers and worked there until 1954 when he went out on his own as a commercial photographer. Besides shooting advertising pictures for the booming Amarillo businesses, he also produced several motion pictures for Cal Farley's Boys Ranch. When I got older, I worked in the studio mixing chemicals and drying prints. The workhorse camera for press and commercial photographers of the day was a venerable 4x5 speed graphic. Shown here is Dad's complete outfit equipped with the first strobo flash unit. That battery pack weighed almost 20 pounds and had a pair of 225 volt batteries in it. Around the camera are virtually every available accessory from classic sheet film holders and roll film backs to a Polaroid back. The Weston Master II was a standard light meter of the day. He kept this gear fully operational until he passed away. Film technology rapidly progressed after the war. Color films, although available before the war, started hitting their stride. Shown here are many popular Kodak films in various sizes used by professional photographers. Available in sheets and rolls, Kodak produced an emulsion for just about any purpose. I can only imagine the number of sheets and rolls I've used. Kodak released Kodachrome film in 1935 and ceased production in 2009. However, they still produce some of the T-Max technology films as well as color motion picture stock. Demand is, however, a tiny fraction of what it once was. Exposing the image on film is only the first step. It was pretty simple to process, or develop if you please, black and white film. It could be done in the kitchen sink, an early apparatus was made for this purpose. Generally, processing takes place in total darkness. The procedure is a chemical reaction on the film's emulsion and depends on time and temperature, hence the reason for the timer. Processing color films is another matter. In a little while, I'll explain how all that came about. Still, chemicals had to be mixed, and that was one of my first jobs. After the negative was developed, fixed, washed and dried, it was then projected or placed in contact with sensitized paper. Then the paper was developed, fixed, washed and dried in a similar manner. Fortunately, this was done under safe lights rather than total darkness. All of these films, papers, apparatus, cameras and chemicals you've seen were produced at Eastman Kodak's Mammoth Kodak Park in Rochester, New York shown here in 1935. At one point, the park employed over 21,000 people. Kodak made just about everything that went into their products. I was lucky to visit Kodak Park on several occasions. Today, it is a mere shadow of its former self. No discussion of mid-century photography would be complete without mentioning flashbulbs. Here are a couple of the best representatives of the flashbulb era. The large number 11s with Edison bases and the press 25s with a bayonet base. Both accomplished essentially the same job. Using either two or three D-cell batteries in the holder, one could synchronize the shutter with the firing of the flashbulb. Fortunately, they were very cheap. Flash holders could also be connected to each other to light a scene with multiple units. The blue colored press 25s were used for color film. All of this was replaced by electronic flash units beginning in the late 1950s. In the Pratt Studio days, portraits were made by available light which came in from a window facing the north, called a north light. The film was very slow and the subject had to be very still. Here is the Pratt Studio and here is the north light. Note the ropes used to adjust the curtains over the glass. The introduction of high intensity incandescent lighting and significantly faster film speeds made studio photography much more practical. Commercial spots and floods as well as good old number one and number two photo floods and big reflectors worked well. Again, the portable electronic flash units came into their own and sent the old stuff to the antique store. 
Here are three typical examples of post-war 35mm cameras. As these cameras began to replace the old folding Kodaks, 35mm became the standard film size for consumer and press photography. These two Kodak 35s are mint examples of mechanical camera engineering. Other makers, including the very early Argus at Wright, quickly moved into the market. The Japanese, however, would soon have the last word. Dad sold his studio equipment in the early 1960s and was hired to build and supervise the photography operation at Pantex plant near Amarillo. At that time, nobody had any idea what they did out there. It was all top secret. Word was they made screen doors for submarines. Anyway, Dad managed a great deal of experimental and technical photography ranging from ultra-high-speed motion pictures to instructional slides and presentations. He often traveled to New Mexico for projects with the engineers at Los Alamos National Laboratory and Sandia Corporation and to the test site in Mercury, Nevada. He would never talk about it, even in retirement. That was when a man's word meant something. In case you haven't figured it out, Pantex was, and still is, the final assembly plant for our stockpile of nuclear weapons. Enough said. My photography career started in junior high and high school where I worked on the school newspapers and yearbooks. In 1969, Dad and I added to our garage and built a great darkroom. I started shooting the usual subjects of a young photographer, windmills, peeling paint, and hit up some of Dad's old customers in Amarillo for commercial work. Woodfin Camp, now head photographer at the Amarillo Globe News, took me on as a part-time shooter. Between that and another part-time job at a local radio station, I was having a great time and learning a lot. Jim Pratt, news director of KVII Television, hired me to run the station's 16 millimeter color film processor and as a weekend reporter news photographer. At that time, all news photography was shot on film, not videotape. Our cameras included the old standby Bell and Howell 70 DRs and Canon Scoopix. For sound on film work, we used Oricons that recorded the sound directly on a magnetic stripe applied to the film. After the film was shot, it was processed and brought to the editing room. A script was written, and the film was cut apart into clips. The clips were spliced together with a hot splicer and timed with a synchronizing block. Some black leader was spliced between the segments. As news programs were slaves to the clock, the night's film reel had to be back in the control room well before the newscast began. Well, most of the time. The film was put on a projector, and the image passed through a series of mirrors and was picked up by a color TV camera. The film chain, as it was called, had two 16mm projectors and two slide projectors and looked something like this. Everybody had a copy of the script, and when the projectionist saw the film leader, he'd call out on the intercom, coming around, and then in the gate and the program director would switch to the film chain camera. He worked kind of like this. This is an actual news clip made when then Vice President Agnew and future President George H.W. Bush visited Amarillo. A far, far cry from what you see today, but for a small market TV station, Channel 7 was leading the pack. Our studio looked something like this, and on occasion I filled in as a cameraman. We used Norelco color cameras similar to these, and they took us over an hour to set up and adjust. At that time, there were no women engineers. After two years at Amarillo College, I went to the University of Texas at Austin in 1973. I worked as a staff photographer for the Daily Texan newspaper and as a stringer for the Associated Press. 
These were exciting times in our country, and the assignments were varied and historical. I photographed two U.S. presidents, many sports events, drank beer with Willie and Waylon, and did a lot of growing up. In my senior year, I was the photo editor for the Texan. It was run just like a real newspaper, and some of the staff members went on to distinguish themselves in national markets. Needless to say, news reporting then bears no semblance to what passes for it today. Once I even had words with former President Lyndon Johnson. He was attending the inauguration of Texas Governor Dolph Briscoe. I was on a ladder, and he bumped into it. He grabbed the ladder and said, Son, you be careful up there. I replied, Yes, sir. Two weeks later, he was dead. After graduation, I took a job with the University of Texas Medical Branch in Galveston. We did all kinds of photography to support the research, education, and patient care mission of the schools and hospitals. While our facilities were somewhat primitive and Galveston was pretty much a backwater, I learned a great deal. Our work included many motion pictures, and we even had an underwater unit to support the university's research into marine biomedical science. I did figure out that making a healthy living in photography would be challenging. Years later, that changed indeed. We moved to Dallas in 1978, and I joined the marketing staff at Mizell Photochrome Corporation. Mizell was the largest professional photo finishing laboratory in the world. Established by Ulrich Mizell in the 1950s, it facilitated the revolution from black and white to color photography. The color processes were expensive, very complicated, and beyond the range of most individual studios. For eight years, I did market research and advertising, eventually becoming marketing manager for their personal photography division. We produced thousands of magazine ads and direct mail promotion campaigns. By 1984, when Apple introduced the Macintosh computer and desktop publishing software was in its infancy, I saw the writing on the wall the days of huge color labs had started to wane. I formed Trinity Graphic Systems and got in on the ground floor. Taking the Mizell business with me, we continued to handle their advertising and graphics and printing production. By 1990, I transitioned away from Mizell and concentrated on developing magazines and books for the model railroad hobby. Later, I wrote, photographed, designed and published two books about Collins radio equipment for the amateur radio market. By the early 2000s, the one thing that was missing in the completely digital age became a reality, digital photography. My wife was a major player in the multifamily apartment real estate business. She suggested I talk with one of her associates about shooting pictures of communities that they wanted to sell. It turned out to be an excellent idea. After a year of doing this, I decided it was time to make the switch to digital. When I told Dad we'd moved into Dallas by then, I'd spent over $5,000. He nearly had heart failure. We never spent that much money on equipment, he said. After he saw the results, he asked, What did you do with the Kodak stock? Dad, I sold it. I replied. For the last 15 years, I've probably photographed over a thousand apartment communities and office buildings all over Texas, Arizona, and Colorado. No longer do we have to worry about carrying bags of lighting equipment, heavy cameras, and film processing. Modern photographic applications such as Photoshop make post-production quicker, more accurate, than we can ever accomplish in the darkroom. I can only imagine what Granddad Pratt would think about the last 140 years. Well, I think that's a wrap. I hope you enjoyed the show, and thank you so very much for watching. But before we roll the closing credits, I'd like to leave you with one thought.